Give it up for Jeremy. Thank you. Thank you, Luke. Ah, yes, the conditions are just perfect, aren't they? You've been and had a nice big lunch. Uh, we're in a very comfy cinema with very comfy seats. Um, luckily, they haven't lowered the lights completely, so it's not dark. Which also means, by the way, that I can see if any of you fall asleep. I will be watching, and I will call it out, just say so now. Um, but yes, yeah, so here I am at uh, Web Dev Conf, and I want to talk about design. Uh, specifically, I want to talk about the design process, which straight away introduces a problem, <laughs> because that's a notoriously tricky thing to try and define the design process. I'm not sure there is the design process. People have tried to, uh, to define it. Uh, here's, here's one attempt at the <laughs> design process. This is, this is the design squiggle by Damien Newman, who was at IDEO. And actually, I think this is a pretty good representation of what the design process feels like for an individual designer, right? At the beginning, where it's just like, ah, all the possibilities. And then, you know, eventually it seems like things narrow down into one. But there's a, there's a different uh, diagram or representation of the design process that, that sort of resonates with us at Clear Left, that we find ourselves turning to a lot. And that's. Uh, the double diamond. Uh, who's familiar with the double diamond? OK, yeah, I don't need to, don't need to explain that much. I mean, it's, it's a very simplified uh, representation of the design process. It's not like these two diamonds are always the same size, or every project has two of them. But yeah, this comes from Chris Vanston at the Design Council. And it, one way I think about the design, uh, the double diamond, is that it's, it's like having two design squiggles <laughs> back to back, right? You get to go through that, that process twice. Um, the idea being that the, the first diamond is all about the discovery and the definition, and then the second diamond is the execution and the delivery. The usual cliche for, for describing this is that the first diamond is about building the right thing, the second diamond is about building the thing right. Uh, but I think the important part here is about what, what you do in each diamond, which is that you diverge and then you converge, and then you diverge again, then you converge again. In other words, you go wide for discovery, right? You open yourself up to all the possibilities, and then you narrow down on you know, uh, building the right thing. And then when it comes to executing again, you want to go wide, open yourself up to the possibilities before diverging into that uh, one final output. Um, and that, to me, is actually the real value of, of this process, is awareness at any point in the process of whether we're in a divergent phase or are we in a convergent phase? And that's something you can apply to, to just about anything. Like, OK, if you are having a meeting, define it at the beginning. Say whether it is intended to be a divergent meeting, where like there are no bad ideas, we just want to get everything out on the table, we want to expose ourselves to all, all possible things. Or is it a converg convergent meeting, where the, the whole point is that you emerge from the meeting with consensus on one particular decision? Because you want to have everyone in agreement on that before the meeting starts. What you don't want in a divergent meeting, like people are throwing out ideas, and you've got that one person going, that will never work. No, <laughs> we can't do that. It's like, it's not that kind of meeting, right? It's a divergent meeting. No bad ideas. Likewise, if it's a convergent meeting shortly before launch of your product, and you need to make some decision, you do not want that one person in the meeting going, I just had a great idea for it, <laughs> right? No. So just, if you take nothing else away, being conscious and, and explicit about whether you're in a divergent or convergent phase of a project or a meeting or anything, that alone um, is, is very worthwhile. Now in terms of the, the process uh, at Claire Left, we used to spend a lot more time, I think, in the execution and delivery side of things. And these days, we spend most of our time in that first diamond, the discovery and definition phase. I guess this is where. It's not a dirty word, but consultancy kind of comes into the, uh, the first diamond. And we have definitely um, edged being more towards consultants rather than uh, delivery. And we've got a whole bunch of things we do, uh, particularly in the, in the discovery phase, um, at the beginning of any project. We've got, we got a game we play called Fluffy Edges. Um, this is about figuring out who's responsible for what in the project. What we're looking for here is gaps and overlaps. Right, you're looking for the, the gaps like, oh, I thought you were responsible for that. No, I assumed you were doing it, right? Um, it's literally like, who's going to do X? Who's going to be responsible for Y? Blah, blah, blah. Super important to get that all figured out early on. Um, other things we do, we've got a thing called a project canvas. It's about mapping out 
you know, it's kind of to do a project scope, um, what, what we hope to get from a project. Um, exercises like pre-mortems. Who's ever done a pre-mortem? OK, you, you're familiar with it. Yeah. Um, the description I've heard of it is it's like prospective hindsight. It's kind of it's kind of like a role playing exercise. You go, okay, it's it's six months after product launch, and it's been a complete disaster. What went wrong? And you sort of act out all the things that went wrong in this hypothetical scenario. And of course, by doing this up front before you've written a line of code, you can then act on those things and stop them from ever happening. Um, and of course, the thing we probably do more than anything in the discovery phase is research. Lots and lots of research. And the point of all of these different exercises is we're kind of attacking one thing, and that one thing is assumptions. Every project seems to begin with assumptions. And that's OK if you make the assumptions explicit, right? So it's very early on, you either want to turn those assumptions into hypotheses and test them, or invalidate them. It's like, oh, it sounded like everyone was assuming the project would involve this, but you know, the research has shown that it'll be, it'll be different. Um, the way I think about assumptions, because they, they, they seem to happen on every project. They're inevitable. Every project begins with assumptions. Assumptions are like this combination of your expectations, usually based on past experience, and your biases. Which Your biases are things that you've internalized uh, that you might not even realize you, your, your feeling or thinking. Right? Everyone, everyone has biases, um, whether we want to or not. And this combination of expectations and biases is what gives us assumptions. Now, this kind of framing makes it sound like assumptions then are inherently a bad thing. But that's not necessarily the case. Like I say, an assumption can just be something you need to turn into hypothesis and test. And we all carry assumptions, assumptions with us all the time. Like if you think about um, your values, what you as a person believe in, those are effectively your assumptions, the, the things you, you hold to be true, to be, to be self-evident, right? And then, so people, individuals have values, companies, organizations can have values, a product, a service can have values. In fact, I'd say they all do have values, whether you make them explicit or not. Sometimes people do make them explicit, right? They, they, they publicly state what their values are. Um, at Clear Left, we have company values. I am not going to share our company values uh, with you for two reasons. One, they're clear left values. So, you know, they're for us. They're not actually that useful to anybody else. Two, there is nothing more boring <laughs> than a company sharing their values. Um, I mean, I say there's nothing more boring, but perhaps the only thing more boring is, you know when a so-called friend is sitting with you and they feel they just have to tell you about a dream they had last night? <laughs> And you have to sit there and you're like nodding politely, like as if that's interesting to you, when clearly it's only of interest to the person who had the dream. That's what uh, company values are like. <coughs> what they do is, uh, what values are there for is for purpose. Why are you doing the thing you're doing? Again, this could be an individual, it could be an organization, it could be an endeavor, a service, a, a product. Um, why is it that you're doing what you do? And then ideally, that purpose should then influence your principles, which is how you're going to go about uh, acting in the world. You know, what, what you're going to value more than other things. And then those principles should manifest in patterns, you know, patterns of behavior. I, in the case of a software product, literally, the interface patterns of that product will be influenced by the principles that underpin it, which were in turn influenced by the purpose of that product existing in the first place. So purpose influences principles. Principles influence the patterns. And that's why I'm kind of obsessed with the principles part, because they sit in this middle bit. They aren't quite as abstract as the purpose, the values, and they aren't as nitty gritty as the patterns, the components of an interface. They're, they're kind of the, the in-between part. Uh, they are design principles. I'm a big fan of design principles. I, I, I'm just kind of obsessed with them to the extent that I collect them. This is the equivalent of my, my interesting rock collection, <laughs> is my collection of design principles that I've, I've put on my website, principles.adactio.com. I'm not saying all the principles on there are, are good design principles. I just, 
enjoy collecting them and, and seeing the, the sort of combined uh, list of principles. Um, and it's kind of fascinating to, to look back through ones over the years. Some of them are, are you know, principles that seem to have, have fallen by the wayside from the organizations who first put them on there. Um, for example, you can find up there uh, the list of principles that Google published a while back called 10 Things We Know to Be True. And it had uh, principles in there like, you can make money without doing evil. Uh, yeah, that's uh, not, not publicly available as far as I know anymore, that <laughs> list of principles. And it's not even the, the only list of principles by Google that's on there. There's another list uh, entitled 10 Principles That Contribute to a Googly User Experience. Which I, um, I hope they remove that one just out of sheer embarrassment of using the word Googly like that. Uh, I have to say, whenever I see lists like this where it's exactly 10 principles, I'm suspicious. Like that, it's, it's, it smells a bit too convenient to me. Like, really? Exactly 10? Like, it wasn't 9 or 11 principles, and you thought, oh, you know, we just need to make it a nice round 10. It just, it smells suspicious to me. Even, even the fantastic list of 10 principles for good design by the amazing Dieter Rams. Uh, wonderful, wonderful principles, but really, Dieter? Exactly 10 principles. <laughs> I, know, I, know, I realized, no, for the designers in the room, that's, that's verging on blasphemy to even dare to criticize Dieter Rams. It is not blasphemy. Blasphemy will be pointing out that in the Old Testament, Moses comes down from the mountain with exactly 10 <laughs> commandments. Really, God? <laughs> not 9, not 11. So, I mean, this, 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 this kind of code smell for design principle, like, oh, it's exactly 10, that's suspicious. It does make me wonder, like, oh, um, are there ways of testing, like, that, that this seems like a good set of principles, or that seems like a bad set of principles? To get meta about it, what I'm asking here is, can we have design principles for design principles? <laughs> and I think maybe we can. Uh, like, let's take an example design principle. This is the kind of thing you would see all the time in the, that list of, of gathered on my website. You see a, a design principle like this. Make it usable. Um, I think this is a bad design principle. Now, I don't think it's bad because I disagree with it. Quite the opposite. It's bad because I agree with it, and so would everyone else. Like, who is going to disagree with this design principle? It's, <laughs> it's so ineffectual, right? And this is the th I think there's a misconception, and this is maybe where values and principles get conflated. The design principles are meant to be this feel-good thing that you, you, know, you stick on a poster with a picture of a whale's tail or something to <laughs> make you feel good about where you work. But actually, no, design principles are meant to be useful. And they become useful by, frankly, leading to arguments and discussion. That's how you know if a design principle is useful. So this, I would say, is a bad design principle or not a useful design principle. Now, let's say it was a design principle more like this. Usability is more important than profitability. Ooh, now, now we're talking. Now, maybe I disagree, maybe I'd agree, but the point is we'd have an opinion, and we could discuss this and go, I'm not sure that's right, or maybe we'd hammer this out. Um, this is actually a really good framing for design principles, is saying, you know, we value one thing more than another. A really nice way to put this is to say, you know, uh, blank even over blank, right? X even over Y. So, to reframe that principle into something really useful, you could say usability even over profitability. Not that we don't value profitability, but in this culture with our purpose and our values, we value usability more than profitability. That's a useful design principle. There's another test for design principles, and that's the reversibility test. The idea to, to test whether like, uh, a design principle is actually useful you should be reversible. You should be able to reverse it, and it would still make sense, but in a different organization with different values and a different purpose. So you can imagine this making sense in one organization, usability, even over profitability. And in another organization, they might say profitability, even over usability, and that would make sense for that organization, depending on their values, depending on their purpose. Um, so prioritization is key to useful design principles. And I think useful design principles means good design principles. Um, my favorite design principle, because yes, I am 
that much of a nerd for design principles that I have a favorite design principle. Um, actually comes from the uh, HTML design principles. It's the priority of consideration. I hear some fans in the audience going, yes. Yeah, nerds, Jesus. Um, <laughs> it, but it is a thing of beauty. It absolutely is. The priority of constituencies states, in case of conflict, consider users over authors, over implementers, over theoretical purity. I mean, first of all, it begins with in case of conflict. Yes, exactly. That's what design principles are for, for resolving conflict or for ha pro provoking conflict, one could even say. They are not there to make you feel good, right? Um, and then users, of, another way to frame this, users even over authors, authors even over implementers, implementers even over theoretical purity. It's all about priorities, and that's, that's super, super value. Um, but like I say, this is specific to the HTML design principles, and you know, as I said, the design principles need to be informed by the purpose and the values of the organization, the product, the service, whatever it is they're in service to. Um, so they should be individual. They should be reversible, right? Makes sense in a different organization. Is it then even possible to have universal principles, principles that would make sense no matter the values or purpose of, of where they originate? Um, maybe is the answer to that one. That we, that there's a whole category of principles that we, we kind of treat as universal principles, and that's eponymous laws, where like something is so taken for granted that we, we declare it to be a law. I mean, usually it's got somebody's name, you some old white guy, right, and they get a law named after them. Um, like Hofstetter's law, named for Douglas Hofstetter. And Hofstetter's law states that it always takes longer than you expect even when you take into account Hofstetter's law. So a nice bit of recursion <laughs> in, in that uh, principle. And it certainly rings true. It certainly sounds to me, it feels like a universal truth. So perhaps that is a universal principle, a law. Um, Sturgeon's law, Theodore Sturgeon was a science fiction writer. And people would complain and go, oh, science fiction, but, uh, science fiction's crap, right? And you go, well, yeah, 90% of science fiction is crap. But that's because 90% of everything is crap. <laughs> and that became Sturgeon's Law. And you're like, yeah, you, you look at movies, books, television, music, and you're like, yeah, that, that feels right. Like, that, that feels like it has the, the, the universality to it. Um, there's a famous one, Murphy's Law. You've probably all heard of Murphy's Law, uh, that you know, anything that can go wrong will go wrong. Usually treated as a bit of a joke, ha, ha, ha. I genuinely think this is a useful principle, mindset to have going into just about any project. Aloysius Murphy was an aerospace engineer, and because of this mindset, he never lost anyone on his watch. Um, and he gets a law named after him. That's Murphy. And there is coal. I don't know if you heard of this one. Uh, shredded raw cabbage <laughs> with a vinaigrette or mayo. Oh, gotcha. <sighs> Moving swiftly on. Th there's, <laughs> There's a more specific kind of eponymous uh, law, which is uh, a razor. And a razor goes kind of back to what I was saying about priorities, like choosing one thing over another. Um, and, and a famous one would be Hanlon's razor. Never attribute to malice that which can be adequately explained by incompetence. It feels very timely, uh, <laughs> looking, looking at current events. Um, and it certainly feels to have the ring of truth. I think we're very easy to ascribe, like, oh, they're so fiendish and clever. And like, actually, no, they're probably just uh, completely incompetent. Although, I will, <laughs> there, there's a corollary to, to Hanlon's razor, which is um, in Arthur C. Clarke's uh, three laws of technology, uh, I think it's the first law states that any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from malice. So if you, as in from magic, sorry, you mash that up with Hanlon's razor, any sufficiently advanced incompetence is indistinguishable from malice. Again, very timely given current events. Um, the other really famous razor would probably be Occam's razor, um, you know, used in scientific endeavors all the time and often simplified to like, oh, the simplest explanation is probably the right explanation. That's not exactly right. Specifically, it's saying that ent entities should not be multiplied without necessity. So like, if you come up with an explanation for something, and your explanation is aliens did it, well, now you have to explain the presence of aliens. You haven't actually helped your case. You've just multiplied all the things you need to explain. Uh, so it makes it less likely to be true. Um, 
So the, these, these universal things uh, can be useful, but as they, most design principles are specific. They're specific to the, the organization or the service or the product. That said, I think we can borrow design principles uh, from adjacent fields. Or in our case, we could probably borrow design principles that influence the very medium we're working with, in this case, the World Wide Web. There are design principles underpinning the World Wide Web. Uh, World Wide Web, created by this man, Sir Tim Berners-Lee. He was working at CERN in the, the late 80s. Uh, and he had, he had made a few attempts at hypertext systems before this. He had a system called Inquire in the early 80s. But it was in 1989, March 1989, he wrote this uh, paper, very dull, boring paper with incomprehensible diagrams called Information Management a Proposal. Um, but a supervisor, Mike Sendall, must have seen, must have seen some promise in this because he scrawled across the top, vague but exciting. <laughs> and so Tim Berners-Lee got the go-ahead to, to build this information management system he, he had in his head, uh, which he went and did on, on this computer. This is the next box. This is in the Science Museum in London. Uh, and that, that's the book, uh, Inquire Within Upon Everything, which is where you got the name for the earlier hypertext system, Inquire. I have a really soft spot for this, um, this machine, this next box, because I was very privileged uh, a couple of years ago to be invited to CERN on the 30th anniversary of that in, an initial paper um, to, to take part in a hack project with this bunch of nerds um, for a week, which is to recreate the feeling of using that very first web browser that Tim Berners-Lee created on that machine. Uh, and you can, you can try it out for yourself. If you go to worldwideweb30.com, you can put in the URL for a modern website and see how it would render in a browser from 30 years ago. This is the very first web page in the very first web browser. Um, I did not build this. I did not even work on this stuff. That was the far, far cleverer people in the group doing that. I spent most of my time working on the accompanying website that was examining where the web came from, where the, the influences, the values, the principles that informed it. I spent most of my time building this, this timeline. Because this was the 30th anniversary of the web, I thought, well, yeah, the obvious thing to do is look at you know, the history of the web, the 30 years since then. But I thought, wouldn't it be really interesting to look at the 30 years before as well and to see what was feeding into Tim Berners-Lee's paper, you know, and ideas about hypertext and, and formats and computing and all this stuff. Um, and fortunately for us, Tim Berners-Lee has been very upfront about sharing his influences. He, he's published Axioms of Web Architecture. This was in 1998, I think, is when he first started writing these. And they're effectively his design <coughs> principles. And I think they're quite useful. I think we can learn from them. I'd say in particular, they're useful for the second part of the diamond. When it comes time to building the thing right, uh, we could learn a lot from looking at the design principles underlying the web. And just as we can borrow from what Tim Berners-Lee has, has published and thought about and written about, Tim Berners-Lee himself was borrowing from what he was building on top of. So the World Wide Web was built on top of the internet. And the internet has principles, has values underpinning it. And Tim Berners-Lee borrowed from, from those. Um, he borrowed from two places, the internet and, and software engineering. He said, principles such as simplicity and mod modularity are the stuff of software engineering. So yeah, let's borrow those. Decentralization and tolerance are the life and breath of the internet. So if you're building on top of the internet, it kind of makes sense to take those same principles and, and run with them. And this one in particular, tolerance. The idea of, of, of tolerance being built into the internet and then being built into the web. A um, lot of that goes back to uh, this man. This is John Postel, uh, responsible for maintaining the domain name system back in the day. And uh, John Postel has an eponymous law named after him. It's also known as the robustness principle. And I think it's a, a thing of beauty. The robustness principle states, be conservative in what you send, be liberal in what you accept. It does have some precedence. Um, the Stoic philosopher Marcus Aurelius wrote in the second century, be tolerant with others and strict with yourself. This just applies it to, to software. Uh, in particular, he's talking about packet switching. right? So it's the early days of the internet. Packet switching is, is how 
data is being transferred. The idea being that um, when you're sending out packets to other people, try to make them well formed. Try to make them you know, solid. Be conservative in what you send. But then when you're receiving packets, incoming packets, you know, if a packet isn't perfectly formed, don't be a dick about it. Right? Don't reject it just because it's not perfect. Be liberal in what you accept. So this, this sounds like it's a very technical, uh, specific thing. And I, I actually find myself seeing this at work all the time in the world of design, just as much as in the world of, of software engineering. So uh, let's take a classic example on the web. You're, you're, building, um, you're building a form, right? Well, the first thing, you know, the first rule of any sort of form design is limit the number of form fields, right? Keep them to the absolute minimum that you need to ask for. Or to put it another way, be conservative in what you send to the user, number of form fields. Then, though, when the user is filling in those form fields, you know, if you're asking for a credit card number or telephone number, don't make them format it in a specific way, you know, with spaces, without spaces. Be liberal in what you accept from the users. So this, this design principle I find, I find very resonant and far beyond just software engineering. Um, but yeah, in the world of development as well, particularly this part. Be conservative in what you send. Like literally, what you're sending over the wire. When a browser makes a request from the server to a server and the server sends stuff to the client, please, people, be conservative in what you send. It's getting ridiculous. Uh, you know, the new HTTP Almanac comes out, and you see the numbers, and you just weep at the amount, just the sheer numbers, the weight of stuff we are sending to users. I was doing some consulting with a client, and we actually ended up making a, a little hit parade of like, what are the worst offenders when it comes to you know, the sheer file size of stuff we're sending to users? So here's, let's have the countdown of the hit parade. Coming in at number four, <laughs> it's web fonts. Um, they can get pretty weighty. But to be fair, there are ways around this. Like, you, you, know, you can have uh, subsetting. You, you use font display to make sure that the user experience is still good, even if it takes a while for the fonts to load. Uh, and now we've got variable fonts, which could make all the difference in terms of, of what you're sending down. So yeah, OK, web fonts might be a problem, but I feel like they're a solvable problem. Um, number three, images. Yeah, there's, there's a lot of weight on the web thanks to images. But again, if you know what you're doing, you can take steps, right? Uh, responsive images is a solved problem now, which is kind of amazing. We, we really have to fight for that one. Lazy loading images, right? You can, you can still make the user experience OK, even if the actual weight of stuff coming down the pipe is big. Coming in at number two, it's your JavaScript. <laughs> the amount of JavaScript you're writing and sending, uh, it's gotten out of hand. Like say, every year, the, the, the numbers just keep going up. And uh, I, I don't get it, because like, we need the JavaScript less and less. There's more you can do now. We saw, you saw earlier with just using has, you can basically build state machines in the browser. Um, yeah, so ease off with the JavaScript. But that said, your JavaScript is not the worst offender because coming in at number one in what we're sending to uh, our users is other people's <laughs> JavaScript. <laughs> a third party. You might be optimizing the shit out of your JavaScript. You'd be doing everything right for all of your content, those three things. And the bugger all you can do as soon as you, you allow, you know, that, that the person in marketing just wants to put that one beacon on the website, and now you've opened the door, <laughs> and other people's JavaScript. I go to a whole bunch of performance conferences, you know, people who care about this stuff and how to optimize your site. You know who I've never seen at one of those conferences is the people who make <laughs> those three. Third party, I, I don't know. T to me, you know, we, we were hearing about security earlier, and I still cannot get over the security model of the web being like, yeah, sure, it's fine. A third party, just, yeah, come on in. Shit all over the place. Do what you like. <laughs> I honestly, it's like, it's, it's a hole that needs to be plugged on, on the web. But, and in, in particular, like JavaScript is different. Like, OK, there's, there's fonts, there's images. You could say, well, you could send a giant CSS file, you could send a giant HTML file. Like, yes. But JavaScript, it's not just about the file size, because there's downloading the JavaScript, then there's parsing the JavaScript, and then there's executing the JavaScript. It's like there's, there's three places where the user pays a penalty. And depending on their device and their network speed, which probably 
will depend on their socioeconomic background, they're going to pay more for that. So there's, you know, there is an, an equity and inclusion angle to this as well. There's even an eponymous law about JavaScript. But to be fair, JavaScript's amazing, right? JavaScript is so powerful. That's why we love it so much. That's why we use it so, so much, because there's literally nothing you can't do in JavaScript. There's even an eponymous law from Jeff Atwood of coding horror fame, who once said, any application that can be written in JavaScript <laughs> will eventually be written in JavaScript. We used to joke about, well, maybe one day you'll be able to build Photoshop in the browser. Ha, 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 ha. Not a joke anymore, which is, I mean, it's amazing. It's amazing what you can do these days. I and mean, the power of JavaScript is amazing. But maybe it's not always the, 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 the thing to reach for by default, right? Maybe there's other ways, more appropriate ways of accomplishing what you need to do. And there is a principle that's at work that directly influenced Tim Berners-Lee working on the World Wide Web. And that's the principle of least power. The principle of least power states, choose the least powerful language suitable for a given purpose. Which on the face of it seems really counterintuitive. Like why on earth would I limit myself to a less powerful language if a more powerful option is available? But in a way, this kind of comes back to Occam's razor about not unnecessarily multiplying entities, not unnecessarily multiplying complexity. It's kind of about keeping it simple. Um, my friend Derek Featherstone, he, he put it really well. He said, uh, in the web front end stack, which he defines as HTML, CSS, JavaScript, and ARIA, if you can solve a problem with a simpler solution lower in the stack, you should. And the reasons he gives for this are, it's less fragile, it's more foolproof, and it just works. So I mean, Derek works in the world of accessibility. He's not even talking about accessibility here. He's just talking about for your own benefit in terms of making something more robust, more resilient, that it makes sense to apply the principle of least power. Choose the least powerful language suitable. If there's something you could do it in JavaScript, but you, maybe you could do it in CSS or HTML, go with the CSS or HTML. They're declarative languages. They're, they aren't. Uh, uh, as prone to error as something like JavaScript, or more fault tolerant. So I, I was thinking about this, and I, and I was thinking about a, a set of design principles. You've probably seen these ones, the government digital uh, design principles, uh, government digital design. And they're a great set of design principles, though there are 10 of them. I'll give them a pass. Um, one of the principles simply states, do less. And then by way of explanation, they say, look, Government should only do what only government can do. The point being that be before gov.uk was built, there were so many different government websites. And they were all trying to do more than they needed to. Like there were existing websites that answered those questions that you, know, you didn't need to go to the government to get the answers to the questions. And like, OK, we need to focus here. Government should only do what only government can do. And I thought that is really, really smart. And I think this can be abstracted to the world of technology. So I abstracted this principle, and this is what I ended up with. Any particular technology should only do what only that particular technology can do. It's getting a bit obtuse now, so let's rein it back in with a specific example of a technology. JavaScript <laughs> should only do what only JavaScript can do. We shall call it Keith's Law. <laughs> no, but like it's basically just reframing what, what Derek was saying. Like, If you can solve the problem further down the stack, do it. Sometimes you can't, and that's OK. JavaScript should only do what only JavaScript can do. So I want to finish up by looking at some potential patterns, components, if you will, that you might come across, uh, where you'd have a choice of uh, how to build them. And you need to make a decision on how you do it. Let's, let's take a, a very simple component, a button, a button component. And one way of building a button component is you use a, a div or a span, you style it with CSS, you add JavaScript for all the behavior, you add ARIA to make sure it's accessible and that it works with a keyboard. That's one option. Or you just use a button element <laughs> and you style it with CSS. So in this particular situation, for this particular pattern, I would say, there is a clear right answer here, which is you use a button. Like, I can think of literally no reason why you would do this. I mean, 
like 10, 15 years ago, it was hard to style buttons in Internet Explorer 6 or something like that. But those days are long gone. There is no reason. And you get so much for free, right? The keyboard accessibility is taken care of for you. Uh, it just makes sense. I'm a lazy developer, so I'm going to go for the lazy option every time. OK, that's a very clear cut uh, uh, decision. Let's look at a different component. A drop down. The user needs to select one item from a list of many items. Again, you could code this up using div spans, style it with CSS, add the JavaScript for the behavior. You're probably going to need to add in ARIA to make it you know, get, uh, accessible. Or you just use a select element and you style it with CSS, which will work um, for the closed state of a select element. Now, once that select element is open, it's kind of handing over to the operating system, and you will not be able to style how the select looks when it's open. So in this case, it's like, OK, if, if you care about that, if the principles uh, where you work are to value the, that's you know, how you style the open state of a select, then I can see why you would reach for something like this. Um, so also, by the way, Jay briefly mentioned earlier on the open UI. That's open-ui.org. It's exactly the kind of thing they're working on, They're trying to say, we shouldn't have to do this. Uh, we should be able to, to stick with the, the layers lower in the stack. And that's why things like select menu, um, accent color was mentioned, stuff like that. We should be able to, to do this stuff. So I mean, so in this situation, me personally, I would still go with the select. I'd, I'd be fine with that. Um, but I'm beginning to understand why someone would do this, depending on their priorities, depending on their principles. But yeah, like I said, I would I'd just go with the select and, and style it and be fine with the, uh, the open state. Final component, a date picker. Yeah, you can see where this is going. <laughs> because yes, your one option is you use divs and spans, style it, JavaScript, ARIA, all that stuff. Or you just use input type equals date. But good luck styling that. <laughs> you've, you've all been there. Like, you're like, oh, it's great. It's just like one line of HTML. And then, oh, yeah. Um, this, now, I would just, again, me personally, I'd still probably go with input type equals date. But I absolutely understand why everyone is reinventing the wheel and making their own date picker components from scratch. Because um, it doesn't feel like it's quite there yet with the uh, the simpler solution lower in the stack. So you, you've really, what, you've, what you're seeing here is kind of, on one level, competing solutions, right? These are patterns, ways of doing things. But really, when you look behind them, what you're seeing here is, is, is competing priorities, design principles. Um, one way of looking at this, like I said, I'm a lazy developer, is like, this is the over-engineered solution. You've got to build everything from scratch. And this is the under-engineered solution, where it's just, I just write one line of HTML, and I'm done. And I will go for the under-engineered solution all the time. Uh, let the browser do the magic for me, which you will be hearing about tomorrow from Andy Bell in his talk, which is mwah, wonderful stuff. <laughs> but to kind of look, look behind it again, what, what's, what the battle really is, it's not between under-engineered and over-engineered. These are going to be more accessible. I mean in, in, in the broader sense of accessibility here of reach a wider number of people because they're lower down in the stack, because of the principle of least power. But this kind of solution will give you more control. So with the increased power and maybe increased fragility, yes, what you gain is control. You have that more fine-grained grain control. So depending on where you work, you might choose to prioritize access over control, or you might choose to prioritize control over access. I take my, my hint from the medium we're building on, which is the World Wide Web. Um, Eric Meyer said, the web does not value consistency. The web values ubiquity. Or to take that and reframe it as a design principle, ubiquity, even over consistency could be seen as a design principle of the World Wide Web itself. And it passes the reversibility test. You can totally turn this around and say, well, for something else, for a different medium, consistency, even over ubiquity. Uh, that's the case with native apps. You, you know, if you build something on iOS, you can be guaranteed a consistent experience on iOS. It won't work at all on Android. So you lose the, the access, but you, you, you get that uh, consistency. Flash was another example of something where the priority was consistency. The priority was that control, that pixel perfection, which was great, but you had to have a Flash plugin 
to view it. So you no longer had that ubiquity. You no longer had the reach. You no longer had the access of the World Wide Web. On the World Wide Web, this is the design principle, ubiquity even over consistency. And you know, I showed you uh, earlier on, I showed you the very first web page in the very first web browser, which is pretty cool that we can like look at that. But you know what I find even cooler is that we can look at the very first web page in a modern web browser. Over 30 years later, we can use a web browser released this week and we can open up the very first web page, still available as its original URL, and it still works. That's amazing. If you, if you took a word processing document from 30 years ago and you tried to open it up on a computer today, good luck, right? It just does not happen. But because of the design principles underlying the web, because the web values ubiquity over consistency, this is possible. So I'm going to leave you and encourage you to apply these principles. Apply the principle of least power. Apply the robustness principle. Be conservative in what you send. Be liberal in what you accept. Value ubiquity, even over consistency. Universal access over control. And if you do that, you will make products and services that aren't just on the web, but truly of the web. Thank you.